coming back here we are talking of a uh, bioinformatics of primer and you know what a primer can do a primer can amplify a uh, any piece of dna right so this will be kind of a uh, starting uh, of bioinformatics for some of the students here and from here on you can take it to whatever level you want to uh, what i want to emphasize also is that even if you're not a bioinformatician you need to know a base bioinformatics today because this field is moving towards a data science biology is fast becoming a data science field where you have a large amount of data that comes up and manual uh, analysis of such data is now not possible so therefore at some point of time you have to even if you are a wet lab person you have to have a bit of a bioinformatics skill to take it forward right so here you are so what is bioinformatics bioinformatics is a subdiscipline of biology and computer science concerned with first generation of data or acquisition of data right so there is a whole lot of data that comes up and there is a whole lot of bioinformatics that is involved in generation of data and most of this data actually is in the form of sequence and also in terms of protein structure right and sequencing when you do the genome sequencing uh, you break the genome into parts and then these parts have to be arranged into a into the order in which you get the final sequence so there a whole lot of bioinformatics get, gets involved and we'll talk of it in some details as we go along then you have a storage so once the data is generated it has to be stored somewhere for others to take it up for final analysis right so whatever is the information you want from there you can retrieve the sequence and then you can do your own set of analysis and then of course it is meant for dissemination of data dissemination of information dissemination of uh, analysis and also setting up new trends right so bioinformatics is a subdiscipline of biology and computer science concerned with the acquisition storage analysis and dissemination of biological data most often this data would be in the form of dna rna and protein sequence data and also in terms of proteins so proteins are slightly more complex than rna and dna in the sense that they, there is a primary sequence which is also present in dna and rna but beyond that proteins can fold into their secondary structure into their tertiary structure into the quaternary structure where the actual functional capacity of the protein is so therefore protein is slightly more complex than when you talk of dna and rna but uh, of course uh, so all of this is inclusive so bioinformatics uses computer programs for a variety of applications including determining gene and protein functions establishing evolutionary relationships and predicting three dimensional shapes of proteins so what all is the applications one of course uh, if you get the raw data it doesn't by it doesn't mean anything by itself right because uh, it is just a sequence of atgc or just a sequence of amino acids you want to derive further information from there so you need to what is known as annotate the uh, the the sequence that you have right annotation means for example if it is a dna sequence you would want to know where are your genes if it is if you have isolated a gene you have come to a gene you would want to know whether this gene how many introns are there how many exons are there then at the level of expression you would want to know whether it is converted into rna and if it is converted into rna how many different isoforms of this rna are there whether there is alternative splicing or not and so on and so forth then once there is a transcription you would also want to know what that is what does this finally translate to right so protein form what is the primary structure of the protein what is the secondary structure tertiary structure what is the quaternary structure what are the important domains in the proteins and so on and so forth so this is one part where you want to understand the biology behind the sequence so you want to annotate it further to understand the biology behind the sequence next you also can because you have the sequence and you can see whether two sequences are similar what is the extent of similarity and you can compare two sequences or multiple sequences together to find out the evolutionary relationships how close or how distant the two sequences are or if you have multiple sequences you can very clearly segregate out that these two sequences are closer as compared to the remaining sequences so that is something that again you do here uh, and uh, if you have heard the quote by dobzhansky he says everything in biology uh, makes sense in the light of evolution so everything in biology when you look at you have to also keep in consideration the evolutionary factor with it right so we'll talk a bit about that as we go through the workshop and then of course you are trying to predict the secondary and tertiary structure of proteins nowadays uh, i'm sure you would heard of alpha fold which is now a ai based algorithm to identify protein structures why this is important why are we doing bioinformatics because one wet lab experiments have prohibitory cost and time overruns right if you if you think of the human genome the first human genome was sequenced in 10 years time at 3.2 billion dollars per genome right so which is uh, prohibitory in terms of cost and time overruns if you talk of protein structure 
if you want to actually do a protein structure confirmation, you have to either go for X-ray crystallography or NMR, or you could go for cryo-electron microscopy. You know, each of these experimenters, one, it requires a lot of infrastructure, very expensive machines, and also at, uh, a lot of time. So what one can alternately do is, since there is now enough knowledge available, based on the knowledge base that is available and based on the knowledge of how amino acids behave or how certain proteins behave, you could use bioinformatics to reasonably and accurately predict the structure of a protein given you have the primary sequence. So that is the advantage that you have with bioinformatics. It gives you uh, a, a lot more and a lot less. So here you are. Over the years, wet lab experiments have generated a lot of data to allow scientists to lay down some basic rules in biology. And then, of course, these basic rules and their ex extensions allow the scientists to use algorithms to predict outcome of an experiment with reasonable accuracy, right? So this allows for quick screening and reduction of search space. For example, if you're wanting to develop a drug, again, something. So, you know, you, you start with, let's say, 100,000 possible molecules that could act as a drug, and then you need to screen it out. So if you do that in wet lab, it is going to be prohibitively costly. Even, even with bioinformatics, it takes around five to seven years to develop a drug. Uh, so what happens is with bioinformatics, with a lot of uh, modeling that is possible now, you can start with a very vast, range of molecules then you could zero down to some of the most probable ones that are likely to behave as your drug and then take them forward so this kind of reduces your search space and allows you to you know bring down the cost of the experiment uh, by several orders of magnitude so that is where again bioinformatics comes in very handy and then of course nowadays what has happened is there has been a shift in biotechnology a paradigm shift we have moved from uh, you know one gene or one protein analysis to move to whole system analysis. We move to what is known as omics. What is omics? Omics is analysis of something in completeness, right? So you want the complete information about the whole set of DNA that an organism has, or the whole set of RNA that is getting expressed at a given point of time, or also the whole set of proteins that are getting expressed at a given point of time. Why? Because everything doesn't act in isolation. Things happen alongside. So if you have just one protein or one, one gene or one protein analysis, it may not be effectively a, uh, a, the correct analysis. What you need to understand is that you, you are in a system and your behavior depends also on the system that you are in. So therefore, you need to have an holistic study of everything put together. Hello. That is where you have this, uh, you know, uh, the coming up of high throughput technologies. This is particularly more enriched in case of sequence data because uh, you have now what is known as next generation sequencing technologies. Uh, we have moved away from Sanger to the next generation where now you can generate a human genome in less than half a day today. And even the cost of sequencing has come down. It has come down to so much so as to less than a thousand dollars now. So this is where the real boom in sequencing data is coming up. And this data is going to be high throughput. You need to have uh, bioinformatic skills and coding skills to be able to analyze this data. What is also important is that biotechnology and biology is now generating the biggest data ever. Until now, the big data term was used mostly for your social media, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram combined. So if you, if you look at big data, big data has characteristically three Vs. It has high velocity. So, you know, at very quick time, people are posting their comments, their photos, their pictures and everything. Then it has a lot of variety. So somebody is putting uh, putting up a picture. Somebody is putting up a text message. Somebody is putting a happy message. Somebody is putting a, a sad message. Somebody is putting up a video and so on and so forth. And then it also has veracity. So the idea then is that until now, this is what's typically, uh, the social media typically was big data because it has uh, a velocity, velocity, veracity, and variety and volume. Now, biology is going to be generating the biggest data ever. So by 2025, it is estimated that the data generated in biotechnology or biology would outrun the entire amount of data that is there in YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram, or other any other social media that you can think of, Twitter included. So the idea then is that when you have such amount of data, it is not possible to manually analyze anything. You have to move on to the next level. That will be bioinformatics, and this will be hard-coded bioinformatics, where you'll, you, know, you will require your coding skills as well. So it is equally important to catalog the findings and store this data in easy searchable relational databases. So one of the important uh, point is also that once the data is there, it has to be stored for access by others and for analysis by others. So therefore, 
Today, majorly, we'll talk of two databases. One, of course, I'm sure you'll be familiar is NCBI. That is the largest repository of biomedical information. And then also we'll be talking about UCC Genome Browser, which is basically a browser-based method to access the genome data. And we'll talk about both in experiments that we do today. <clears throat> then, of course, uh, biotechnology is, and, and biomathematics, the effort is to development of new tools for better sensitivity and specificity of predictions using new algorithms based on machine learning, artificial intelligence, etc. So now we are also gradually incorporating AI and ML into our uh, system of, of predictions. And that is again going to be the next paradigm shift in biotechnology. Uh, basically, all of this is improving our, uh, our, our power of prediction and more accurate predictions. And that is where, again, bioinformatics becomes very relevant and very important. So the idea is that uh, wet lab and bioinformatics are not, uh, you know, antagonistic to each other. They complement each other. So informatics helps in better wet lab experimental design and vice versa. So, you know, of course, uh, bioinformatics is based on what you've done in wet lab earlier. And now you can use that prior knowledge to design your better experiments and with more information. Information is power, as it is said, right? So this is, uh, they are not competing with each other. They are basically complementary to each other and are completing each other. So that is the point that is why we are into this mathematics workshop, because this is so important. And this is now, you know, the, the basic requirement, even if you're not a bias mathematician, a bias mathematician hardcore would always know how to code. But for those who do wet lab also, there is some certain level of basic mathematics that you can always do. And that is where we will go now. So now, of course, we begin with the basics first. So all of you are familiar with central dogma. It represents the flow of information in biological molecules and biological systems, so as to say. And you have DNA, you have RNA, you have protein, and this is the most common way of flow of information. In some cases, exceptional cases like retroviruses, you could have an RNA that could be serving as the blueprint, and it is then reverse transcribed into a DNA, right? And then, of course, DNA can self-replicate, and this is your central dogma here, right? Now, uh, what is also important is that DNA being the genetic blueprint, it is relatively stable and does not change during the course of a lifetime, right? So DNA is almost very stable, extremely stable. RNA and protein are space and time specific. So the RNA uh, concentration can be different in the morning. It can be different in the evening. Likewise, a protein uh, may be expressed in certain, uh, let's say a protein that is expressed in eye may not find expression in, in, in let's say, the liver because eye is meant for a function of visual appreciation while liver has more of a metabolic function. So therefore, these are space and time specific. Also, what is expressed in the morning may be different from what is expressed in the evening. So if the RNA is different, of course, the protein concentration would also vary, right? So this is important. RNA and protein are space and time specific expression. And uh, if you look at an individual's lifetime, there are infinite space and time combinations. So therefore, uh, this is the reason why we still cannot confidently say how many genes are there in the human genome or how many proteins do we actually code for because of the infinite space and time combinations which have not been explored yet we still have an idea of let's say around 22,000 or 23,000 or 25,000 genes are there in the human genome but nobody worth the salt can put up a money on it and say okay it is 25,200 because we have not explored yet and this again is where bioinformatics come in to help you try and predict how many genes could possibly be there so through the analysis of the data, we know that, okay, a gene would have a start codon, a stop codon to say the minimum, if you talk of uh, prokaryotes, and it would have some codons in between. So you can use this paradigm of what is known as an open leading frame to reasonably predict how many different genes can be there in this particular genome of a bacteria and so on and so forth, right? You're following class, everybody. You follow? Yes sir. Yes, sir. Okay. yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Now, now you have to switch off your mics. Okay, don't forget that. All right. So here we are. <clears throat> so not all genes, all RNAs and all proteins are known till date. And there again, you have this part that is called genome annotation, where we want to look at using bioinformatics, we want to predict how many possible genes because we know the basic structure of a gene and that can be used to, you know, reasonably say, okay, this region, while the the, the uh, corresponding protein or the corresponding RNA has not been uh, identified yet in wet lab, but this is likely to code for a protein. So this is where we are. And now, of course, what we're doing is we're moving into what is known as 
the omics revolution. So omics essentially means that you're using the entire DNA as your reference, not just one gene, two gene, or not just genes, but also the other part. You'd be surprised to know that in, if you look at the human genome, genes are only 2% of the human genome. There is another 98% that is not genes, but it is there. So what we're trying to look at is now just uh, not just the genes, but the entire content of DNA that is there in the human genome, 45% of it, more than 50% of it is repeats. There is another 40% that we do not know of. There is another 4% that is more of a regulatory region. So we are trying to now study the entire DNA as a whole, not just individual genes. So when you take the entire DNA of an organism, one full complement of, of an organism and study it, that is what is known as genomics, right? So DNA genomics. Likewise, when you study the entire RNA that is expressed at a given space and time, that is your transcriptomics. And likewise, you have the entire protein in a given space and time. And you could be doing, and most commonly what you're doing is a comparison. <coughs> I'm sorry. So you have a normal tissue and you have a diseased tissue and you want to know what are the genes that are responsible for the diseased phenotype. So what you're doing, you compare the DNA first. You want to look at what is the DNA variation that is corresponding to this particular type of phenotype that you're seeing. You can come, you can then compare the gene expression levels because it may so happen that, you know, there is no difference in the DNA, in a major, major problem with the DNA. But it could be that, you know, there are uh, the regulatory regions is where the problem is and therefore the RNA that is expressed is less or the protein that is expressed is less. And what you get from here is not just one protein information, you get all the differential proteins or all the differential RNAs. So now that is the paradigm where we are moving. We are trying to compare the entire genome, the entire transcriptome, entire proteome to identify the functional states. Also the reasons for the problems that you see, uh, you could compare any two phenotypes. It could be normal versus diseased. It could be a plant resistant, resistant plant versus a drought, uh, versus a drought sensitive plant and so on and so forth, right? So this is uh, where we are moving. Now coming to the very basics, I'm sure all of you know. So let's talk of nucleic acids. So we are talking of DNA. So if you talk of nucleic acids, you have a pentose sugar, and then you have a nitrogen <laughs> base as carbon one. <coughs> I'm so sorry, I've been traveling for you know, four days now, so a bit of a, uh, you know, congestion. And then of course here at the five prime end, you have the phosphate bonds. So this is basically a nucleoside. And then when you uh, have the combination of phosphate, base and sugar together, that is a nucleotide. And nucleotide are polymers uh, uh, which basically form the units of the nucleic acids, right? And I'm sure you also know that there are uh, two types of uh, nitrogenous bases. You have purines and you have pyrimidines. Purines are adenine and guanine. Pyrimidines are cytosine, uracil and thymine, right? So here you are, you have a five carbon sugar. This could be ribose or deoxyribose depending on which nucleic acid you're looking at, they differ at second carbon. Ribose will have an OH and deoxyribose will have an H group, right? And then, of course, uh, you could have nitrogenous bases, purines and pyrimidines. And then, of course, you have a phosphate group attached at the five prime, uh, fifth carbon of the pentose sugar, right? And then I'm sure you also know about the DNA double helix model. So you have the two strands running anti parallel to each other. This is the Watson and Crick model, Nobel Prize in 1962. Uh, key features include double-stranded right-handed helix, 2 nanometer in diameter, 10.5 base pairs per turn. Then uh, the two strands run anti-parallel, which means that if this one here at 5 prime end has a phosphate, it will have a 3 prime end here, and this will have a free OH. And likewise, at the opposite end, the configuration will be just the opposite. Also, the nucleotides on the same strand are connected to each other by phosphodiester bonds, and between the two strands are connected by hydrogen bonds, which is uh, two hydrogen bonds in adenine and thymine, and there are three hydrogen bonds between uh, cytosine and guanine, right? So individual nucleotides on the same strand are connected to each other by phosphodiester bonds. The nucleotides on opposite strands are linked to each other by hydrogen bonds. So I'm sure all of this you know, right? Now coming to the sequence formats. So uh, most of the effort is now to sequence the DNA, also sequence the RNA, and also look at the proteins at any given, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, space and time. So there are, because all of these sequences have to be, uh, again, analyzed through a certain uh, pipeline in bioinformatics, all of these have a specific format. The sequence has to be mentioned in a specific format so that it is, this file is automatically read by the second program that is going to analyze it, right? So in databases, DNA, protein, and RNA sequences are most commonly stored in FASTA format. What is the FASTA format? FASTA format is a simple sequence format where you have a first line, which is called the DEF line, the deaf line begins with a greater than sign, 
and there is a small annotation of the sequence, which means that there is just one small line stating what the sequence is about, right? And this could just be the coordinates of the sequence or just the name of the sequence or in case the accession number and also a bit of a detail. For example, here I show you PBR322 sequence, which is the simplest plasmid, uh, the, the most common of the recombinant plasmids that we started with. So this is the faster format. This is the most common format. Now, of course, if you look at the next generation sequencing, there's another format called as the fast Q format, right? And the Q stands for quality. So we'll come to that later, but for now, protein sequence, the primary sequence of a protein or the, uh, the sequence of RNA and DNA would be in the form of FASTA format. And then there is also another format that is a GenBank format. When we go to the practical, I'll show you what this means and we'll have a look at more details of this as we move along. Protein uh, database. So if you look at protein uh, structures, so protein can have two types of, uh, you know, the files. One is the, of course, the sequence file, the primary sequence file that would be in the FASTA format. Then you could also have the tertiary structure file, which is in the form of PDB file format. And you can see there is a whole lot of uh, fields here and we'll not be, be discussing this in details because we'll not have time. But of course, you know, you should know that protein, the, the basic structure uh, data of protein is written in the PDB format or protein data bank file format, right? Uh, then we come to data repositories. As I said, when the data is generated, it has to be stored somewhere for other people to access and analyze and use it for future use. So there are major data repositories that are available and there is a whole lot that is available. I pick up some of them because uh, there is something that is most common. So one of them is NCBI. I'm sure all of you have heard the term. NCBI is National, National Center for Biotechnology Information. This is a huge database. In fact, it contains many databases. Also along with the databases, it also contains a lot of tools and we'll have a, a, a close view at NCBI today. Then if you want to uh, browse through the genome sequence data, then you have a specific uh, browser that is known as UCC Genome Browser or University of California Santa Cruz Genome Browser. This allows you to you know, zoom into specific regions in the genome, pull out the sequence and, uh, and also look at the annotation tracks. So there's a whole lot of annotation that is already available. If you have your own annotation, you can also add your tracks or customize tracks and add here. Then of course, Protein Data Bank is basically for uh, protein structure. And then you have Uniprot Knowledge Bank, Uniprot KB, which has two parts, Swissprot, which is the curated data. And this is, we are talking more, more in terms of the protein function. And then you have Tremble, which is more of a computer prediction. So there is a whole lot of entries in Tremble. Uh, uh, there is lesser entries in Swissprot because here somebody has sat at the back end and manually curated and found whether the report that has been developed is correct or not, and then put the entry. So this is more reliable data. This is also reasonably reliable data, but the, here you'll have a lot of hypothetical proteins where, you know, uh, the computer says it is a protein and it is likely to have this function, but uh, in wet lab it has not been shown yet. So this is uh, some of the major data repositories. We'll have a look at NCBI. So if you go to NCBI, this is the home page, and you can see here uh, at the top, you have all databases, you have uh, a resource list A to Z. Again, you have all resources here, and then of course you can click on any of these. In the center panel, you have the facility for submitting the data. You also have the facility for downloading the data. There is a whole lot of uh, literature that is available here. You can go to learn and, and basically uh, there is bookshelf, there is uh, PubMed. You can have a look at that. Then of course you could also use NCB API and code and libraries to build applications. You can analyze your data. So there is a whole lot of tools that are available here. And then of course you have uh, you know research and collaborative projects. Uh, so this is your NCBI and NCBI is so vast that nobody what is salt uh, can teach you NCBI in, in one hour. We can only have a look at some of the glimpses and, and you know give you a basic introduction. Based on your requirements, you can use NCBI for whatever you want to, right? So this is NCBI is the single largest biomedical uh, database that is available. If you see here, when you click on all databases, you have a whole lot of databases that are available here. So this is a whole lot of things. We'll do some of it here. Uh, as I take you through the practical. Uh, if you want to search for organisms, you can type the search for sapiens. It will take you to this page and here you will have the genome of the human, uh, the reference human genome, the GRCS38 assembly available here. I'll show you a glimpse of that as we go along. So GRCS38 is the current assembly. And by the way, uh, it will be relevant to tell you that, you know, the GRCS38 assembly was uh, is the current assembly. 
and the human genome was first released in 2001. The finished draft was released in 2004. It is only 20 years after this, approximately 20 years after that, that last year we have been able to publish the first complete human genome. This is called as telomere to telomere assembly. And this is also because there has been a paradigm shift in the sequencing technologies from short read sequencers to long read sequencers, right? And we'll talk a bit about that uh, depending on how much time we have, right? And I'm sure you would have heard these terms, Illumina, Ion Torrent, Nanopore, PacBio. So these are PacBio and Nanopore are long read sequencers. By the name long read, you mean they can generate very long sequences from one sequencing, uh, you know, sequencing, uh, starting sequencing from one end. So uh, PacBio and uh, Nanopore can directly read at least 10 KB, 20 KB of sequence from one end of the DNA. In comparison, Illumina and Ion Torrent can only read around 150 basis. So there is a very distinct uh, difference between, uh, you know, the short read sequencers and long read sequencers. If you want to know more, you can again go back to my YouTube channel. Um, there was a lecture I had given, uh, I think, two years back, and even the recent lecture is there. So I keep taking these lectures very recently, and some of them I upload here, so you can have a look at and the current trends in sequencing and the 40 years of sequencing, right? Now, if you look at NCBI again, so you have your databases. There's a whole lot of databases that are there. Uh, then you have PubMed, which is basically a, 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 a whole lot of biomedical literature is available here, right? If you want to search for my paper, you can go to PubMed and type Vipin and Risky, which is the keyword in my first publication. And you would be able to access this paper here, which is my first publication came from my PhD. And you can see I'm also the first author as also the corresponding author of this paper, right? So this is uh, something that is uh, unique and generally doesn't happen. I'm sure there are other people who have a first and corresponding author in their PhD, but uh, for me, it was a big achievement, right? So here you are. Then there are a whole lot of databases available, genome, gene, sequence read archive. So sequence read archive is important because this is where you store your next generation sequencing data coming from Illumina and Torrent, Nanopore, PacBio, and others, right? And then of course you have gene expression omnibus where you have a lot of uh, serial analysis of gene expression data, microarray data, and so on and so forth. Uh, then there are protein databases that are there. You have uh, PDB, SwissProt, GenPept, and so on and so forth. We will not go into the details of this for now. You could go back to again NCBI, you could go to genomes, it will take you to certain genome sequences. What is a genome? Genome is a complete sequence of an organism, not just genes, but also everything else that is there, right? So that is uh, one full complement of genetic material in an organism is what a genome. So that is your genome, right? And you could click on again human genome and you could do this. If you go further, probe further, you'll have your human genome sequence here and you'll have downloadable files, right? So here you are, you have the pasta format. As I told you, FASTA format begins with greater than sign, one def line, and then the entire sequence. So this is uh, distributed chromosome wise. Then you have this one is the annotation file, genome feature format. So every file will have a format, a fixed format, so that it can be read by another program downstream. So therefore, these formats get very important. This is the genome feature format, which is the annotation files. Then you have the variant calling file. If you have your, your own sequence that are comparing to the reference, what are the positions where your DNA is different from the others or from the reference is what is your variant calling format. And this is from ClinVar, DBSNP or database of single nucleotide polymorphisms, DBVAR and so on and so forth, right? So just to get you started, tell me this uh, answer for this. If you have a double standard DNA, each strand with 100 bases, how many phosphodiester bonds are there? You have one minute to answer this, right? Double standard DNA, each strand with 100 bases, how many phosphodiester bonds are there? Anyone? All right, so we have 30 seconds left now. Okay, Someone anyone? has required 198. Very good, which is, which is 99. right. 198 Replies, is correct. Answers are coming. Okay, so 198 is correct. I, I cannot see the chat here. That's the problem, right? So, I, I okay, so 198 is correct. So, what do you do? You have between two nucleotides, you have one phosphodiester bond. Between three, you have two. Between four, you have three. So, basically, it is N minus one, right? So, there are 100 bases per strand. So, therefore, you have 99 phosphodiester bonds for 
100 nucleotides and this is two strands, so 99 into 2, that will be 198. So 198 is correct. Whosoever has answered that is correct. 99 is not correct, right? So that is where we are. So, okay, so with this now, we can move to experiments and we will do simple experiments today and we will take this forward tomorrow and do further more experiments on this, right? So here we are. First, of course, is what we're going to do is to uh, uh, my so retrieve the sequence for PBR 322 from NCBI portal. So what we're going to do today is to retrieve the sequence from NCBI portal and also enumerate the differences between the gen bank and the faster format of the sequence, right? So this is one experiment we are doing. And second, I'll also introduce you to UCC genome browser. And here we are going to retrieve the sequence of human gap DH gene sequence and also will demonstrate the utility of sequence formatting options here, right? So these are two experiments. Let's go to first experiment first. We are going to retrieve the sequence of PBR322 from NCBI portal right here. So this is the home page, ncbi.nlm.nih.gov, right? So NIH is National Institute of Health. This is one of the biggest and the most elaborate biotechnology labs in the world, right? So here you are. This is the home page, if you see here. And uh, uh, first, of course, on the top, you have all databases. And if you do a drop down here, you'll see there is a whole lot of databases that are available. Right, and we could look at uh, any of them here. So, for the purpose of DNA sequence, we the the databases are important, which are important to us is nucleotide, and then also we could look at the genome database. Right, so we'll go to nucleotide first here. So here we are in nucleotide, and now we can give our search to. Right, you could also have done a search on all the databases. So let's uh, do that first. So we do all databases by default, and we're looking at PBR. 322, right? And you say search. So this basically the search engine at the back end of NCBI is what is known as entries. And it is giving you wherever in all the databases in NCBI, wherever the entry has been found in bookshelf, the PBR 322 entry is found 40 times in mesh terms, one time, NLM catalog, two times, PubMed, 4861, PubMed Central, 28,000, and so on and so forth, right? So it will give you wherever in whichever database you have the entry with the name of PBR322, wherever the term matches, it will give you the uh, the number of hits that it has identified uh, in all the databases that are there. So what we do again is we go back and we select a specific database. So we select nucleotide now, right? Everybody with me, class, you follow? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, yes, sir. good, 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 good. So we come to nucleotide and we now again mentioned PBR322, right? And uh, P is a small, P is for plasmid and BR is for the names of people, I guess, right? So here you are, you can again do this. And if you see here, the second uh, option here, cloning vector PBR322 complete sequence, right? So we will go for this one. We can directly click on this and pull out the sequence from here, right? And if you see here, it already says, 4361 base pairs, circular, and other genetic. Other genetic meaning, this is a plasmid sequence. It is not the main genetic sequence for the bacteria, right? So here you go to now the, uh, our, our query was nucleotide, and what we're looking at is now the PBR322 sequence. And currently what we're looking at is what is known as the GenBank format. So what is the GenBank format? GenBank format will have not just the sequence. If you scroll down here, you will see the sequence, right? But beyond the sequence, it will also have a lot of annotation. What is annotation? Annotation is additional information about the sequence, right? For example, here, it will have several fields. It says locus, and it says PBR322, 4361 base pair, DNA, circular, and then it also gives you the date when the submission was made here, right? Uh, 30th September 2008. Then it's, it has a field called definition, this is cloning vector PBI322, complete sequence. Then it has the accession numbers for the sequence, right? And there are several accession numbers that are there available for PBI322. Version, this is the first version of the sequence. Keywords, ampicillin resistance, beta lactamase, cloning. So you know that there are two genes here in, in case of uh, PBI322. You have the ampicillin gene and you have the tetracycline gene. Tetracycline gene is basically your beta lactamase uh, in terms of functionality, right? So this is, and these are drug resistance genes, of course, you know, these are drug resistant proteins. It has an origin of replication. It is a plasmid. It has tetracycline resistance, which is also the beta lactamase here. 
right? So, and then of course, source is cloning vector PBR322, organism is cloning vector PBR322, and then it has a whole lot of references where all it has been reported. So, these are your uh, papers and their references. So, this uh, this paper where it was mentioned came in Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences, USA, uh, and the volume is uh, 1978. And then, of course, the volume is 75, and these are our page numbers 37372, 3741. So, this is how you basically do your referencing of uh, when you have to cite a paper. This is one of the methods of citing a paper, right? So, and then, of course, there is a whole lot of other papers where it has been referenced. Beyond this, when you come down here, it will also give you uh, some of the uh, position wise uh, functional features that are there in this sequence. So, first, 124361. One, this is a cloning vector PBR322 molecule type is other DNA. It is not the chromosomal DNA in, in bacteria. It is the other DNA, the extra circular DNA, the extra chromosomal DNA, which is in the form of a circuit, right? Then it has, a, uh, uh, again, a taxon ID. Then you have a source 121762 plasmid PSC1. Then you have a, a lot of explanation of what each part of the sequence is doing. And then, of course, you have the first one here. That is the gene, tetracycline, and its translation into what is the protein it is getting formed here. So from position 86 to 1276, you have the first gene, that is the tetracycline gene. And this uh, protein that it translates to is this one here. So what is this? This is the annotation of the sequence that you have. Apart from the sequence in the GenBank format, you also have its annotation in details, whatever is known about the sequence, wherever it has been referred to, what are the publications where it has been referred to, all those information would come. So there are multiple fields. And then, of course, if you move down further, you have the sequence here. And if you can see here, this is left index. You have numbering at the left. You have blocks of 10 nucleotides uh, and six such blocks in one line. Can you see that class, everybody? So this is your block of first nucleotides, the second nucleotides, the third nucleotides, and so on and so forth. And because the next one begins at 61, so you have a uh, index of 61 here, 121, 181. So what this helps you is basically if I want to look at 185 nucleotide, so I know this is 181, 182, 183, 184, 185. This is 185. And if I want to look at, let's say, uh, you know, uh, 210, so this is 190, 200, this must be your 200. And so this is basically to give you easy access to a specific uh, position that you want to travel into your sequence. And then at the end, you will have these double uh, forward slashes. That is to basically indicate that the file has ended. And this is the last line in your GenBank file, right? But for most applications that we want to do downstream, we would not require a GenBank file. What we require is only the sequence, not the annotation along with it. So for that, if you see that on top, there is an option of FASTA, right? So you can click on FASTA. And now the sequence uh, format will shift to FASTA. If you see here now, this is only the sequence, nothing else. And you're on top, you have a greater than sign. And you have the def line, which is basically to uh, a very short annotation of the sequence that you're looking at. This is in terms of the accession number. Also, what is this? Actually, a cloning vector, the name of the cloning vector. And it is mentioned this is complete sequence, which means that, you know, it is not a partial sequence. The entire plasmid sequence is given to you here. So this is the FASTA format. Now let's say I want to, you know, uh, you want to you want to uh, copy it to a file. So how do you do that? One way, of course, the the most, uh, you know, the the most uh, simple way is to do a Control A. Uh, I mean, select everything, copy and paste somewhere. But then, if it is a very large sequence, this would be very difficult. You may have to scroll down so much that at some point of time you may lose your uh, touch and you lose the selection. So the NCBI provides you an option of uh, of this option that is called a send to. So you can send to and you can send to file, right? And uh, then, of course, you could say format is pasta. If you want, you can change the format to whichever format you want to, GenBank, summary, GenBank, full, and other formats are also available. But we'll go to pasta and we'll cre say create file. Right. So this is now going to create a file which will have a certain name that I'm going to give now. Right. So this is some of the photographs I had from the yesterday's Miranda House workshop. So I'll save it in the desktop now. So let me go to desktop and here you are. And here you are. You can say, let's say we save it as sequence, right? And we say save. And there you are. 
So we can access this file now from the desktop itself. And I don't know what is this and why this is coming. I think it is a part of your Teams thing, and I hope I do not lose connection after this. Yes, this is fine. So here is your sequence file, and you can see that. Everybody with me, class? Right. So this is your entire sequence copied directly to a file. Uh, this is a uh, in the Notepad, and the file format is. If you look at this, this is dot faster file. So the file format is faster. Uh, you could look at properties here, and this is a. If you see, this is a faster file dot faster file right so this is what it is and if you want to change you can change here you can make it a text file but most commonly for biological sequences faster format is what is the most acceptable one so this can be directly taken up by uh, by everyone so this is uh, one thing now let's do another thing let's uh, uh, since SARS coronavirus has been so impactful in our lives uh, I was actually in Paris when the, when the pandemic started and I had no plans of returning because I had an extension of my postdoc and then it so happened that uh, my boss said, OK, if it is uh, tomorrow, the airspace is closing for Paris, uh, for France. If you don't leave today, you will never be able to leave. And we don't know how long you have to stay and your visa is coming coming to a close. So he suggested me to uh, go back to India. So that is when, of course, Corona uh, kind of, you know, uh, cut short my postdoc and I came back to India again. So let's now look at uh, some genome and look at the genome of SARS coronavirus, right? So we say, uh, you know, and you know that, you know, the reference genome for SARS coronavirus is the Wuhan uh, sequence, right? So we'd search as SAR SARS, ARS SARS, OV, and we can say Wuhan. And we can say search, and this should ideally take you to the reference sequence of uh, so here you are if you see here this is the SARS coronavirus respiratory syndrome SARS coronavirus 2 SARS CoV-2 as it is uh, technically known because there was a SARS CoV earlier as well and this is the reference genome if you click on this this will now again take you to the SARS coronavirus genome and you could have the genbank format first this is the genbank format this is the and the uh, the sequence ID NC underscore Four five five one two zero. All right. So if you see here, this is your NC zero four five five one two two thousand twenty nine thousand nine hundred three base pairs single stranded RNA. Right. So this is a single stranded RNA twenty nine thousand nine hundred three bases. Linear. Right. It is viral and it has been submitted into the NCBI on eighteenth July twenty twenty. Right. Definition: Severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus two isolate Wuhan. HU1 complete genome, right? And then of course the accession IDs are there, version is there. This is the second version of the same sequence, some, some correction in the original sequence. This is coming from the bio project, uh, a petrol project from there. This has been sequenced, that is there. Then of course the source is uh, SARS-CoV-2, uh, then organisms, again SARS-CoV-2, virus, uh, key terms, virus, ribovira. So this is the classification of the virus. So this is basically your Genbank format where you have a lot of details and then of course the publication and then of course the uh, the the uh, the genome annotation right so for example here you have the first uh, ORF that is called ORF one AB which finally results in some sixteen different proteins right so this is the uh, translation of that and then of course you have other proteins and then of course you will have here if you see you should have a S protein or the spike protein, right? So if you look at it, let me see if we can find it here. Control F and we say S, right? So S with the space should do for us. Uh, no uh, all right, so this is. All right, let me search with the spike then. S is too many, right? S P I K E. So here you are. If you see, this is your spike glycoprotein, right? And this is the uh, why is we are looking at spike glycoprotein because spike glycoprotein is the one that interacts with the receptor on the human cell. What is the receptor on the human cell where it interacts? Anyone? Hmm. 
angiotensin and converting enzyme 2 very good very good. okay so this is uh, you know uh, and again you could go back to the faster format here and you could you know uh, just do the faster format and then of course uh, you could download the whole genome remember this is just 29000 some nucleotides almost around 30000 and the battle is between 30000 bases and 3.2 billion base pairs and we know what is winning right because even today now uh, delhi and other places there has been an alert about the resurgence of coronavirus infections right and i'm coming from delhi only yesterday and i have a lot of cold and a lot of flu but uh, could be because of exertion because this was 3 days of extensive workshop uh, almost 6 hours every day and uh, continuous talking so sometimes it gets very engaging and, uh, and but but the workshop was excellent in the terms of the feedback i got from the students and and very nice uh, i'll share some of them in my youtube uh, uh, very very nice uh, uh, feedback i got so here you are this is your uh, sequence here right and the beauty of this is also what you can do is directly if you want to find a homolog you could do a run blast or you could if you want to design primers you could say pick primers it will come to tomorrow right we will not do it today we will come to it tomorrow 